Yeah, g'day and welcome back to this old lathe channel where I'm working on modernizing this beautiful old Schaublin 125 CNC. At this stage in the build, I'm just going through system for system and doing all the wiring hookup and then testing the systems to make sure that I can get them to work. Schaublin implemented two mechanical methods of spindle speed control. On the one hand, there's a gearbox, either one to one or one to 6.5, but then there's also a mechanical variator which uses expanding pulleys to mechanically change the spindle speed. So I complicated things further by adding a variable frequency drive. But my aim this week is to get this mechanical variator system under control. Next up is the spindle encoder. Now because this encoder has been wired up as a TLL single ended signal rather than as differential, I just need to move all of these three jumpers over one place to the left. And now I can connect it up. Now we're going to start Linux CNC, switch over into the settings page, use the hell show to look at encoder pins, encoder zero, and we want to watch the outputs of the A and B channels, and let's look at the raw counts and the main counts. Now as I turn the spindle, we can see the counts rising. And as we turn the spindle the other way, we can see it reducing. Awesome. It's that easy. Now let's just set the spindle to about the zero. Okay, that's about there. Now if I turn one rotation, we'll see how many encoder counts we get. Yeah, it's about 8,000 counts. So I'm going to need that value when it comes time to scale the output of the encoder into RPM. So with this command, which can't be loaded until after the interface loads post GUI, with this line I can connect my velocity of my encoder to the bar graph in GMockerPy showing the speed. That's down here. I still have to scale the input speed, but you can see we've now got a speed coming out correctly here, so 300 RPM. I got another little maintenance job to do this week. Sometime in autumn I bumped against this pressure damper accumulator thing and water started pissing out everywhere. This is just for the watering the garden system. It didn't need to water in winter so I did nothing about it. Maybe it would magically fix itself before summer. Yeah, I think it's got a broken weld or something. Yeah, it looks like the weld rusted through there. Well, made in 2007, so I guess it lasted 15 years. Speaking of things breaking, I was looking at the Aviation Herald at the crash of that 737 in Guangzhou last week, and I noticed a pretty strange thing that the very first press report speaks of no inspections of the pickle forks on the affected aircraft. I thought you might be interested, what are the pickle forks of a 737-800? There's a pretty good summary of the issue on the 737.org UK website. Basically, the pickle forks are the interface between fuselage frames and the wing spars. Obviously, primary structural members have turned out to crack on the 737-800s, but normally not until they get to significantly higher cycles than that aircraft likely would have had, because it was only like seven years old. So there you can see a repair if you find cracks on them. I'd be very surprised if that was causal for the crash. Oh, that's lucky. The local tool store seems to have exactly the same model. The plumber who did the water system in our house recommended using a hexel blade and just putting some scratches in the threads of these pipe threads. And in fact, a lot of the new fittings that you buy actually have those scratches in them from production, at least here in Austria. Then a bit of this stuff. That's what they tend to use over here. This is not drinking water. This is just for watering the yard. And then the hemp. Those scratches in the thread just help the hemp grip the thread better. Yeah, I figure an industrial plumber who mostly works on high-rise building projects with you know hundreds of apartments, whereas company can't really afford to be called back in to repair leaks. I'm guessing he knows a thing or two about getting stuff 
nicely sealed up on the first attempt. It was about time I got this fixed. It's been incredibly dry here in Vienna. I think this is the 28th day in a row without any rain. The garden's dry as a bone, so it's about time it gets a bit of water. All right, now a leak check. Well, that's good, it's not leaking. So, now I can water the garden. I think the tulips seriously need some water. Still, a few of the bulbs have come out. As has the rhubarb. I really appreciate all the feedback I get from you guys. It's kind of like having a crowdsource quality system that actually works. Last week, I set this new 5 volt power supply at slightly below 5 volts. I was figuring that if my control electronics are designed for a maximum of 5 volts by going slightly under, I couldn't damage them. But a lot of you pointed out that that's really too conservative. It's better to set this power supply at slightly above 5 volts because you're going to lose, you know, a tenth of a volt or so through the, through the wiring. So I'll do that now. This way I should get 5 volts at the user. The next system I'd like to bring under control is the variator. So how does the variator work? The lower and upper pulleys are spring-loaded. The upper pulley is spring-loaded together. I think the lower pulley is spring-loaded apart. And then there's a mechanism to adjust the spread of the lower motor. By forcing it closer together, it forces the belt to ride up on the pulley, increasing the effective diameter. At the same time, it pulls on the upper pulley, forcing it apart, reducing its effective diameter. And the mechanism to do that uses a little three-phase motor here, which acts through a little angle gearbox down to drive a lead screw with a nut here, which rotates this bell crank. That pushes on the inner surface of the pulley, squeezing it together. Over here there are two limit switches with striker plates, which are the high speed and low speed stops. So let's wire this up. So here's the schematic. Three phase comes in through a current limiting breaker and then down to either the clockwise or the anti-clockwise uh, contactors to the motor. And then for control, we've got 24 volts coming down through a high-low selector switch, through the variator end stop switches, and then we've got inhibits here from the offside contactor, so you can't do counterclockwise if clockwise is going and vice versa, and then off through the coils to the contactors. At this stage I'm not going to try and bring it under Linux CNC control. I'm just going to use a simple switch to bias high or bias low speed. So this is my 767 cargo loading panel which I got out of the rubbish bin 25 years ago. Pretty impressive how aircraft wiring's done. Huh? I've already removed a couple of switches but you can see how they're beautifully loomed together with this lacing sort of tape. Also the splices, all very well sealed. I need to open up this lacing to release some of the wiring. So given that tie wraps were invented for aviation, why does aviation even today still use some of this lacing? I'm not an expert on this, but I'm guessing it's because lacing's more secure, lighter, and also kind of softer. It doesn't have those sharp edges and doesn't cause the indentations in the wire that the tie wraps do. I don't know, what do you think? Any of you got an idea why they keep using lacing in aviation? It's incredibly labor intensive. So these are my variator control relays. I've got them set up so far that I just use a simple momentary switch, speed up or speed down. I think I might have the feedback switches around the wrong way. I didn't label my two feedback end stop switches for the variator because I wasn't sure if I had them in the right orientation. And sure enough, I didn't. But now that they're switched over, I can put their labels on them. Now to test this system, I need the spindle running. So for that, I need to turn the whole thing on. So let's have a look at it in action. Take it out of e-stop. Start the spindle. I'll just slow that spindle down a bit. Right, let's see if we can, if the variator's working now. All right. That's maximum speed. All right. Goes all the way down until it hits the end stop and goes no further.
Okay, so let's mix up him there. And we've got to mix up him on the spindle. That's three and a half thousand. You can only move the variator when the spindle's actually turning. It's very bad for it to force it against a stationary belt. At this point, I haven't thought through the software to actually control the spindle. What have I got? I've got a three-phase motor running at a single speed. I've got a gearbox, which gives me two different speeds. So this is like 1 to 6.5 or 1 to 1. And this gearbox can, has to be switched when stationary. Next up, I've got a variator. A pretty wide speed range. However, can only be switched when running. And then finally, I got the VFD. So it seems I'm going to end up with a speed range of about 3,500 RPM down to next to nothing. Let's have a look. So if 3,500 RPM is the highest speed, I wonder what the lowest speed is. I've just blown the gearbox down into low gear, so let's check it out. Let's start the spindle. Minimum speed on the variator, back gear, and if I go down to S.1, which is my 20 hertz, so my slowest RPM is just under 40 RPM. Boy, that's slow, huh? So there you see it, with this uh, setup, I end up with a speed range from pretty much 36 to 3500, which is pretty good, huh? Nearly 100 to 1 speed range. Now I know that Andy Pugh has already written a software component to control a VFD plus a gearbox. The question is, do I just stick with those two and leave the variator as a manual switch where I bias the whole system high or bias the whole system low before starting a job? The gearbox can't change speed during a cut, but the variator can. So having the variator under Linux CNC control is also quite attractive. So I need to, need to have a think about this. What are your thoughts? How would you do it? Would you bring all three under Linux CNC control? Now with lathes doing constant surface speed cuts, uh, you can't have a gearbox changing gear during a cut, but you can change gear ratio on the variator and you can change frequency on the VFT. So it's quite attractive setting it up to set the gearbox at the start of a cut and then control those two during a cut. The question is, is it better to do all of the speed control possible on the variator to maximize torque, or is it better to go through the full range of adjustment on the variable frequency drive, and only once you run out of adjustment there, going to the variator? How would you do it? Please add your comments, I'd appreciate the feedback. Well, thanks a lot for watching. If you're watching this when it first comes out, i got a Patreon live stream starting in about 20 minutes, so if you're interested, sign up, come and join me over there. It's about the sizing of excess motors for a CNC machine. Thanks for watching.